The next lecture is The Forgotten War and Post-Korean War by Dr. Suji Woo. Dr. Suji Woo is an associated professor of American Studies at California State University, Flirton. Uh, she received an MA in Asian American Studies from UCLA and PhD in American Studies from uh, Yale University. Okay, Dr. Wu. Good, great. Um, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Kim, for inviting me to be a part of this uh, terrific seminar. And Jenny, thank you for all of the work that you do to, and everyone to organize this. Um, I think that today's the first day of your seminar, so I hope that you've enjoyed your morning. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the Korean War and the events that led up to the war, what happened during the war, and the aftermath of the war that came to involve the arrival of Korean immigrants to the United States. So I wanted to begin with the events leading up to the war. And I, I should preface this by saying that um, the Korean War is one of the United States' so-called forgotten wars. And I hope that in this talk, uh, we will all come to see how critical this war was and the impact that this war had, of course, for Koreans, but also for um, America. So I hope that we could, um, we'll be able to, to see that. So after World War II, the relationship between Korea and the United States changed dramatically. On August 6, 1945, President Truman deployed one atomic bomb in Hiroshima, and three days later dropped a second bomb on Nagasaki, killing tens of thousands of people, and um, later with the radiation poisoning, uh, many more. The bombs led to Japan's surrender in the war. It also resulted in the loss of Japan's colonial holdings, which included Korea. Japan had colonized Korea officially between 1910 and 1945 until the end of World War II. So with Korea newly liberated after World War II, Koreans were eager to finally establish their own government and to have this independence. But the United States and the Soviet Union intervened. These were the two new superpowers after World War II, and um, that Korean independence would not be allowed to happen. So there were US military commanders. Um, they feared that the Soviets were very interested in this newly liberated Korean peninsula. And on the evening of August 10th, 1945, which was a day after the United States dropped a second atomic bomb in Japan, the State War Navy Coordinating Committee asked Colonel Dean Rusk and Charles H. Bonesteel to divide the Korean peninsula. And this is how we get the 38th parallel. It's rumored that the young colonel spent less than 30 minutes deciding upon the 38th parallel, which was then an invisible line that would cleave division so deep and permanent that the chasm can now be seen from space. And we all know the 38th parallel. We all know about, and here's a, um, an image, an aerial image of the demilitarized zone. And, um, but at that moment, the idea was that this was going to be a division that would give the US some semblance of control in the peninsula, but also um, you know, allow the Soviets to have control as well, because they, the US felt that the Soviets would not allow full control of the peninsula. So this is really how the 38th parallel um, comes to be. So beyond the geography of the demilitarized zone is the human cost of division of the hundreds of thousands of family members who are separated by this line. So between 1945 and 1948, US occupying forces established military bases and implemented economic aid programs in the South while the Soviet Union administered control of the North. And U.S. officials build the military occupation of South Korea as a temporary trusteeship, and the post-war measure um, was intended to put, to stabilize the region. So, if at this point, if the Truman administration was initially unsure about the level or duration of U.S. commitments in Korea, it would be the war that solidified its indefinite place in the peninsula. On June 25, 1950, North Korean soldiers fired across the demilitarized zone, and the United States entered the war unilaterally, committing U.S. air and naval forces with President Truman's verbal support, but in advance of United Nations, Pentagon, or congressional approval. And the U.S. military was supposed to leave the peninsula in 1948, but the military had stayed on in Korea, and this is why the U.S. military was so easily deployed um, as soon as these skirmishes started to happen across the border because they were already on the ground. 
So this, the war really began as um, US officials at first described it as a quote unquote limited police action, but it really turned into a full scale war as soon as China entered on the side of North Korea in October of 1950. While technically the United Nations fought in Korea, which was made up of multiple countries, the United States made up 90% of all UN troops. And during the war, the US had dropped 635,000 tons of bombs on the peninsula. And the peninsula is about the size of Minnesota and entire cities were completely wiped off the map. The war claimed an estimated 34,000 American, 900,000 Chinese, and over 3 million Korean lives, and the majority of Korean lives that were lost were civilians. So when you look at these numbers and grasp the scale of this war, you can see that while this is considered one of America's forgotten war um, wars, it changed the very fabric of Korea and those who lived through the war. Also, I should note that the war is technically not over. The combat years happened between 1950 and 1953, and there is an armistice that was signed in 1953 that ended the fighting, but it did not technically end the war. So this war is still um, technically not over. So I wanted to turn now how it was that Americans learned about the war and really how it was that the war introduced Americans to Korea. The US Department of Defense, um, they began to do make they began to launch publicity efforts, the US Department of um, Defense did, and they sent cameramen to the front lines to capture footage from Korea during the war. And these are the images that were then edited and brought to the United States primarily through newsreels. And here's a newsreel from April 26, 1952. And in the first half of this newsreel, um, which I don't show here, it shows American tanks and planes that are dropping bombs across and crossing the 30th parallel. So here are some film stills, stills of the images of the kinds of imagery that you see in the first half of the update on Korea. And then the second half, I'm going to have us listen to here. So I hope the volume will work. Let's see. So a lot of these um, clips that are coming from Korea, it shows this blend of U.S. military might, cuatro you know, the tanks and the planes. Cuatro. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, and, um, and so it showed this military might alongside humanitarian aid. So it showed the very same soldiers who were dropping the bombs were also providing humanitarian aid, primarily to refugees, but particularly to children. And so this footage was often edited to kind of create this image or this understanding of both sides of the United States, this powerful US war technology, while simultaneously covering over the destruction caused by these very same machines. By showing how American GIs cared for Korean children, the US military was able to assuage some of the criticism that they were receiving for killing innocent Korean civilians during the war. So this is one example of the kinds of news that reached the US during the war. Um, here's another example. This is an image from National Geographic of 1953. Um, and this is coming closer towards the end of the combat years. And the caption for this photograph reads, young cowboys just off the Korean rage relax with Roy Rogers. And the three boys here are reading a Roy Rogers comic book, although it's likely that they don't know how to read English. Um, they're probably looking at the pictures. And this image, as you can tell, is very staged, right? You know, the children are all being asked to look at the at this book. They're all being asked to smile. Um, what is uh, interesting for me too in this image is that the middle boy is wearing cowboy boots. And there are many photographs of Korean boys during and after the war that showed them dressed up as cowboys or in, army, or in US Army fatigues, uh, kind of demonstrating this idea of an embrace of American culture. Probably the most well-known or highly publicized portrayal of Korea in the United States came in the form of the Korean Children's Choir. In 1954, 25 Korean children who were between the ages of 6 and 12 years old toured 50 American cities and sang to sold-out audiences. They sang in the Carnegie Hall. Um, they were sponsored by the American Korean Foundation. They were really popular. They sang at the White House. Um, they were on a TV game show named that tune. So they were very well known. They had their own record. This is um, their record that came out with Urania 
records and uh, the, all the proceeds would go towards these fundraising efforts to help people in Korea. Um, they were also really a source of pride for Korea. Here's some clips from Korean newspapers. Um, President Ri, Singman Ri felt that unlike the wave imagery that often stood during the war, children needing help, Fire kind of did the opposite. It promoted these images of Korean resilience, democracy, and potential for eventual independence. The choir goes on to raise over $10 million for post-war recovery. And during the tour, it was continually emphasized that all of the children were quote unquote double orphans, meaning they had lost both of their parents. Um, and this was actually not true. Most of these children did actually have surviving parents, but the narrative on the US side was that children were orphans. And as a result, many Americans actually tried to adopt these children, but they couldn't because there were no official protocols for transnational adoptions at this time. And this is really interesting because one has to ask themselves, like, how is it that Americans wanted to adopt Korean children? If we think about the context of US history in the 1950s, we know that this is a time of ongoing segregation and ongoing civil rights activism um, of the very small population. There was a very small population of Koreans living in the United States at this time. The population of Koreans were roughly 8,000 um, and 7,000 Koreans lived in Hawaii. And so there was also um, still immigration restrictions from Asia that were in place. That 1924 Immigration Act that banned immigration from Asia was only slightly modified in 1952 with the McCarran-Walter Act that allowed for 100 visas from each Asian country annually. So that's a very small number. Um, it was also unusual that Americans were trying to adopt Korean children given this entire context. But I do think that Americans came to care for Korean children through the lens of war through the images and appeals um, to help them. And Americans came to know about Korean children in the 1950s, primarily through the news that reached them from the war front. But it really wasn't until the work of missionary adoption advocates that the practice of transnational adop adoptions became a possibility. So here is a photograph. This is Harry Holt, and this is his wife, Bertha Holt. They were Christian evangelicals who spoke uh, publicly and often about the plight of mixed race children in Korea. And these were the mixed race children in Korea. These were children who had Korean mothers and predominantly U.S. servicemen fathers who were born during and after the war. And in 1955, um, the Holt, the couple, the Holt's mixed race Korean children. And this is a photograph from that day. He would call these um, operations where he would bring children to the United States. He would call, uh, refer to them as baby lifts. And he was also very um, public. He was very savvy when it came to publicity. He invited all kinds of reporters to come to kind of chronicle the event. And so many people learned about these so-called baby lifts where he would bring these children to the United States. In 1956, the Holtz go on to establish the Holt Adoption Program, and the Holtz worked closely with President Syngman Rhee, who in 1953 ordered a directive to send all quote-unquote half-American children to the land of their fathers. And so the confluence of these efforts and a series of accompanying adoption laws opened the path to adoptions from Korea, and this is really the origins of transnational and transracial adoptions. Between 1953 and 1965, over 6,000 Korean adoptees came to the United States. And while in the 1950s, an estimated 70% of adoptees from Korea were of mixed race parentage, the US media still centered primarily on full-blooded Korean children when sharing news of these overseas adoptions. So while the mixed race children were the ones who were, who were um, the largest number of children coming over, the media still tended to focus on these full-blooded Korean children, primarily because um, it was a less complicated story uh, to, to present to the American public. So I wanted to show you one example of the many examples that there are of these um, stories, these you know stories that came out in the press to introduce Americans to these new Korean adoptees. So this is Ri Kang Yong, and he appeared initially in overseas relief posters during the war. So this is him when he was younger during the war. 
And then flash forward in 1956, as shown here, he's adopted by a white American widow who lived in Los Angeles. And these are images from Life magazine. And it shows him, um, it captures images from his first day on American soil. And it shows him doing all of these American things, right? He's writing a carousel, talking on the telephone, watching television. Model narratives like these often supplanted the experiences, uh, the experiences, the trauma that was experienced by these children. It also didn't address what was happening, um, what the rest of their lives would look like in the United States. So instead by focusing on the first day, it kind of um, forecloses an understanding of, of what happened before to these children and what would happen to them afterwards. And um, again, if we think back to, again, that context of the 1950s United States and visions of the white middle-class nuclear family, you could see how it was that the Korean child had to be made less foreign um, in order to make them more acceptable. So you look at what he's wearing here, this gingham shirt and these um, like khakis, uh, he is wearing Western clothing here. Um, and that's really shown to kind of um, demonstrate how assimilable these children would be. Uh, when you look at case studies of how it was that these children came, you see a very different picture or experience of the children. There are reports of children who, um, who are chanting that they want to go home to Korea. There are reports of children who cry uncontrollably. There was one uh, case study that I saw where a child who refused to eat rice was interpreted as a sign of rapid adjustment, adjustment as opposed to a possible sign of homesickness. So in these ways, these model narratives about Korean adoptees, it really didn't allow for the loss experienced by these children, many of whom had lost one or both of their parents in the war, um, but of course had been separated from their family in this move to the United States. So the U.S. media focused on families um, that were produced by war, but these interracial international families communicated this Cold War message of U.S. racial harmony that the U.S. government um, really relied upon, especially in the context of the Cold War and its effort to show the world what a great racial democracy the United States was and why democracy was better than communism. These kinds of stories really helped to support that. But what the media, of course, didn't show is how this production of family in the U.S. also meant the simultaneously breaking apart of families in Korea. And so archival records show that American missionaries and social workers, when it came to the mixed race children, um, it showed that American missionaries and social workers who were working in Korea to place these children in the United States, they often coerced Korean mothers to give up their mixed race children. Uh, missionaries would often find mixed race children and follow them home so that they could talk to the mothers. They would bring Korean translators so that they could convince the mothers to relinquish um, control of their children. And they would also bring photographs of happily placed mixed race children in America to convince mothers to give up their children to adoption. And many mothers, uh, although many mixed race children did end up coming to the United States, there were many mothers, about 30% of mothers of mixed race children, they tried to raise their children in Korea, even amidst extreme discrimination. Uh, the women often hid and cared for their children as long as they could which meant that when they could no longer do so, the children were often older, like eight or 10 years old, which made the separation that much har harder. Mixed race children had to undergo um, US racializing processes in South Korea in order to uphold black, the black and white color line in the United States. So for the children who were slated to come to the United States, they had to be, um, their racial makeup was identified in South Korea before placing them in the United States. So I wanted to show you one document here. This is a child report from the Holt Adoption Agency from 1965, and I've blocked out all the information, personal information, but I, what I wanted you to see is this spot where an administrator could quickly describe the child's skin color, describe the complexion of the, of the child. They also would compare the, um, there was always a photograph that was attached to the side of this. And here is where they could say, oh, the child is lighter or darker than what appears in the photograph. And if you look down here, you see these different check boxes for the administrator to denote the color and texture of the child's hair and the color of their eyes. And these practices were really intended to determine if that child's father was white or black. 
And the reason for that is because on the U.S. side, when the children were placed in these homes, they often, often followed the white black racial line. So if it was a Korean white child, they tried to place the child with a white American couple. And if it was a Korean black child, they would try to place the child with an African American couple. And so these kinds of, you know, these are very much U.S. racializing processes that didn't exist in Korea because Korea was very um, homogenous in terms of, of racial makeup. But this is a process that is really introduced to Korea at this time in order to support um, U.S. racial logic, but also support this arrival of mixed race children. Another group that I wanted to focus on in terms of how the Korean War ends up coming to the United States is a look at um, Korean military brides. So after the Korean War, in addition to the arrival of Korean and mixed race adoptees came the arrival of Korean military brides. During the war, Korean brides were a novelty and like all Korean adoptees, they carried the potential to communicate Cold War narratives of internationalist exchange. And you see that here, here's another um, you know, story from from Life magazine. This is from 1951, so it's during the combat years. And here we meet Lee Young Soon, who married right here, um, who married Johnny Morgan on Valentine's Day in 1951. <clears throat> and you see this narrative of, of exchange. I know these images are pretty small, but um, this is Johnny Morgan's parents wearing humbooks that um, that. Lee's parents sent to them in the United States. Here is Lee Young Soo learning how to make uh, Johnny's favorite Carolina style gravy from her new mother-in-law. So these narratives about exchange were often the focus of these kinds of stories. But after the war, when the peninsula remained divided and over 70,000 U.S. servicemen were still stationed in South Korea, it became clear that Korean brides would no longer be a novelty, but would instead be the steady source of immigration. And if we think about, again, the 1950s in the United States, there are still anti-miscegenation laws in over 40 states at this time. And um, so it, these, uh, these interracial couples were not necessarily being welcomed at this time. And today there are over 100,000 Korean military brides in the United States. And I think that further complicating the image of this interracial coupling uh, of Korean military brides in the 1950s was that Korean women were associated with US militarized prostitution in South Korea. So as a result of all of these factors, US public acknowledgement of Korean military brides was supplanted by safer versions of Asian women. And I'm gonna give you just one example. Um, one example of the safer version came in the form of the Kim sisters. And here they are at a very young age. Um, they started singing for US troops during the war in Korea when they were children. So this is an image from Korea in 1952. And um, later on, a U.S. agent discovered them in Korea and brought them to perform in Las Vegas in 1959. And I should note that it's actually two sisters and a cousin. Um, Mia is the cousin and Aija and Sue are the, are the sisters. But I think that the title of the Kim sisters sounds you know, snazzier than the Kim sisters and their cousin. They went Kim sisters. And here is their, uh, their first um, they were a huge hit. I often think about them as the first um, K-pop band in, in the United States. Um, they appeared on the Ed Sullivan show over 25 times. They were like a favorite act of Ed Sullivan. And this is the cover of their first record album. They performed in Las Vegas um, for many years. And I just wanted to show you a clip to give you a sense of their performances. This is from the show Hollywood Palace. It was filmed in the 1960s. Milton Berle was the host. And when he introduced them, he introduces them as the multi-talented sisters who could play 20 instruments. So I'll let you watch just this short clip of their performance. We cannot hear the sound. Is it too loud? I cannot hear the audio. Oh, okay. Oh, I don't know how to fix that. Um, I could hear it on my side. Uh, could you hear? Oh, 
or that's okay. Let's continue. I'll share the video okay. link later with the participants. Okay. So you couldn't hear it, but they were singing that song. I'm not going to sing it, <laughs> but they were singing that song. I think I'm going out of my head over you. Okay. I ended up singing it, that song. And then at the end, um, they're now playing, you know, the, the, I think this is the marimba and they're playing this at the end. And so they played the bagpipe. I mean, they played so many different instruments. So they were viewed again as these kind of extraordinary, extraordinarily talented um, sisters who would sing these very popular American songs. They would also occasionally sing Arirang, which is the Korean, um, you know, which is a Korean anthem song. So they would sing both of these songs, but they would sing primarily in English. And that's what I wanted to show you that you could hear. Um, the media, in addition to being extremely multi-talented, they were always described as being these very innocent virginal sisters. So any kind of spotlight on them would say like, well, what do you do about the back door, what do they call them? Backdoor Johnnies who like will ask you out over the show. And they always responded in these very demure ways like, oh, you know, I always just tell them, uh, you know, if, if I, if I do go out with you, you have, I have to bring my sisters, like we're never apart. Um, they were viewed as these very innocent um, young women. Here is a, a story about them in Life magazine from 1960. And if you see here, if you look at images of, of adoptees, it often shows especially the girls in ponytails. This is like such a, this is a, an image that you would often see of um, Korean children as adoptees. And you see that this is kind of how the sisters are being shown, even though they're not adoptees. Um, so again, one of these ways that I think they're also, they were known for their signature ponytails. Um, they would often talk, the media would often talk about that. And so the Kim sisters, I believe, were a safer way for Americans to culturally make room for Korean military brides in the 1950s and 60s. They worked kind of as a cultural for the increasing arrival of Korean military brides. So these are some of the ways that Korea arrived in the Cold War to the United States in ways that were both imagined, how they were produced in American culture, and real. Close to 14,000 Korean immigrants arrived to the United States, the adoptees, brides, and exchange students in the decade following the war. And um, this first immigrant group, or I, it's, they, this is considered the second wave of Korean immigration, first wave of Korean immigration happened in the early 1900s, primarily to Hawaii. And after the war, this is viewed as the second wave of Korean immigration. And then later on, and as I think you'll learn in um, other lectures in this program, the uh, arrival of Korean immigrants in the 80s, 70s, but also especially in the 80s afterwards, um, many of the third wave of Korean immigration could be tied to this immigrant group. So it's estimated that 40% of post 965 were through a connection to a military bride. Um, and it was through the familial clauses of being allowed to enter through, you know, relationships to someone who was already in the United States that many Koreans were able to come to the United States so, um, under the auspices of family reunification. And so the Korean military bride actually is really central to understanding Korean immigration. <clears throat> so when thought about in this way, the Korean had a really profound effect on the millions of Koreans who lost their lives, but also, <clears throat> excuse me, millions who survived and were for the war. It had a direct impact upon the Korean children and women who ended up in the United States. So um, the lasting effects of this war is experienced really on both sides of the Pacific. And of course, if we think about our current, the U.S.'s current relationship with Korea, the U.S. military is still, is still stationed in South Korea. Today, there's an estimated 24,500 U.S. service women stationed across 15 U.S. military bases in South Korea. And this is the third largest U.S. military outpost outside of the United States following Germany and Japan. And we know that tensions between South Korea and North Korea remain extremely um, unstable to this day. So we've all heard, right, the new Korean, um, North Korea testing missiles and questions about nuclear capabilities over, over the past decade um, and, and still ongoing. These are some 
reasons why um, I think for many people bringing an end to the Korean War is a pressing issue. And there is a coalition of scholars and activists who are currently working we bring an official end to the Korean War through various resolutions. So I, I hope that if we you know, think about all of these things together, it becomes really clear how the moniker of the Forgotten War is one that couldn't be further from the truth, especially for Koreans who don't have the luxury of it. And I wanted to uh, an overview of a lesson curriculum. And I um, I worked with several people to work on a uh, lesson plan about the Korean War and also about the origins of transnational adoptions. And this was developed for 11th graders for their U.S. history and social studies um, segment and also for their ethnic studies values and principles alignment. So for those of you who teach in the 11th grade, this probably sounds familiar to you. <clears throat> but I did want to share some resources that I think might be helpful to, um, to multiple grades. So in this lesson plan, I really tried to center on two topics that I feel essential for students to learn. I do feel like students should know about the Korean War, and I think they should um, be able to tie to immigration. Excuse me. I have... And so the first um, lesson that I have, or the first kind of resource that I have, is about the history of the Korean War. And, you know, I want, of course, I think it's important that students know that the war happened to understand its devastating impact on Korea, and also to think about how this war is connected to the United States, and how it's been foundational for US Korea relations um, since the 19 since 1945. So this is a really terrific uh, documentary film. It's called Memory of Forgotten War. Uh, I don't, I think that the material in it, because it covers the war and it talks to um, Korean, Korean survivors of the war, it's very graphic. Uh, and so I think that it would be appropriate for high school and college students, but study guide is still a really useful resource for all, for all of us teachers. Um, so let me just, I just took a screenshot, some of um, pages here and I have the to get access to the study guide that's publicly available. So they give you suggested audiences. Um, they give you different topics that are issues that are raised by the film. They show you um, in multiple pages, there's a really pretty detailed history of how it is that the war comes to Korea, what happens during the war and what happened afterwards. So there's a really good um, section there. And they also have suggestions for discussion. So they have really good discussion questions. They also have more focused discussion questions for um, older grade levels here in the study guide. So this is just a really great resource um, that I think is really helpful. And at the end, they have additional resources. So some of them are online resources, but I did just want to point to this right here, oops, which is still present pasts Korean Americans in the Forgotten War. And this exhibition, Korean War. Um, it focuses on war and legacies. It has an array of um, Korean and Korean American artists uh, who do everything from performance to, um, to fine art to assemblages. And so it's a great way to bring art uh, into discussions of, of memory and war for, for your students. And the second lesson that I have centers on Kore uh, Korean adoptions and focuses on the immigration or the transnational adoption of Koreans to the United States and its very origins. And so um, here's one of the activities that I included. And this is the same article that I showed you earlier. And students can, you know, when you read the text of this life article, um, it really is, it's fascinating. You know, it tells um, this very positive story about, about this Korean adoptee. And the exercise for the students is to read the article, underline the words that signal life about Korean adoptions and also to analyze the photographs to talk about, you know, what does this communicate to the American public about who these Korean children are, um, about their ability to become American, like what does it, what do these photographs signal to you? And so there's, um, there are lessons and questions that go along with this and then kind of counter this public construction of who these children are. Um, the other part of this lesson is to watch a doctor documentary film. And this documentary film is, is one of me, but really one of my favorites. It's called First Person Plural, 
and it's about a Korean adoptee's search for her Korean birth mother. And so I'm just going to show you a clip. I, um, could Ginny, you let me know if there is no audio for this one. And then if there is an audio, um, I apologize, but you could look at the images and I'll, I'll kind of talk you through what's happening. So if yeah. you could let me know. Got it. We're off to another different time in our life now. We, we understand. We can hear it. Better. Um, I'm sorry, you can hear it or you can't? It was kind of soft, but I think audio was working. Okay. All right. Let me try it again. I'll try and turn up my... Um, We're off to another different time in our life now. We Sounds good. understand things better. And uh, hopefully it will bring us closer. From the moment that I arrived from Korea um, to San Francisco, uh, my father filmed every moment of our life together and really captured this whole process of my becoming American. The film is about my adoption and everything sort of going wonderfully, except that at a certain point, there's an unexpected turn of events. And I discovered that I wasn't who everybody thought I was and discovered a whole new identity. This was a time, I think, in the United States where total assimilation was the norm. And they didn't think of any other way to deal with me, really. To me, it was quite scary. I was afraid I was going to lose you. Traditionally, adoption is so much about cutting off the birth family. There's so many and hidden tensions and things like that. This matter of non-communication is a two-way street. It's exactly what you did now. It was the door. My hope is personally adoptive parents would be able to watch it together and that it might give people courage to open up. So this is a really powerful film um, that I think could be shown to probably middle school and upper school that really, uh, I think, expands students' understandings about who immigrants are, um, <clears throat> about how war can affect uh, in our migration processes. Um, so I think that it's a really powerful film and they're, um, it's one that I, I show my college students and uh, it's a really powerful way for students to grapple with what, it, what is the AD experience. So if Life Magazine showed us a kind of um, representation of who Korean adoptees are, what is actually who was brought to the United States and what is what does that journey look like? Um, so ultimately, you know, in this particular lesson, I hoped that students would come to see how the political relations between U.S. and Korea, um, how these decisions and actions of nations actually have a direct impact on the lives of individuals in the United States and Korea. So I think I'll go ahead and end there and leave some time for questions.